Once again, Sprues and Spruettes, we are back for another episode of Trapped Under Plastic. Oh, that was a whisper one. That was a whisper boy. I can't like I see I can't see you. You're like hiding behind a mic arm. <laughs> I know. I don't I have the mic arm in a wrong spot. I think I do. You could like angle it so that I could see your you know, kinda of like this. I can do one of these. That works. I'm gonna break the thing. All right, technical break. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you can see the rest of my face. All right, we're back. Okay. Um, John. How you doing today, buddy? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. It's been a hectic two weeks for me. Yeah. And I'm glad to be here. Why don't you just talk about the life of having a full-time job and trying to make a video every once in a while? Every once in a while, yeah. Um, I think having my set myself to a two-week schedule so I do a video every fortnight because I just want to say fortnight more. See, yeah, okay. I didn't want to speak that out into existence, the fact that you're doing it every two weeks, but now you just have, so yeah. now people are going to expect it. Mm-hmm. This, is how my, this is how my brain works whenever i say something on the internet i have to accomplish that and if i don't i have to give a reason why i can't accomplish it oh well that's your own fault I, it is it is see to me i am a natural procrastinator and so <laughs> if i don't put that out into the universe um i i'm just scared that it'll just slip and slide and it'll be like well, in November I had one video, in December I had two videos. Like, no, I can do it. I can accomplish it. And uh, with usually it, it's not an issue, at least so far, until I have a little bit of a hiccup that's going on with my current situation where I have a collaboration that I'm doing where I had to paint a whole kill team hmm. in like three days in addition to my actual video that I was creating. So that was a bit hairy in the Hendersons, but. <laughs> Um, outside of that, it's been, it's been good. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. All right. That's good to hear. All right. So let's get on to the preamble ramble, which I was recently told we stole that phrase from someone. We didn't steal the whole phrase. They, <laughs> they call it the pre ramble. Okay. And ours is just a far superior name. Okay. All right. Yeah, I agree. It is so, superior. Um, we're talking about, Oh shit! What's the name of Blake's podcast? Blake's podcast. You remember his name, but not the name of the podcast. Yeah, Life After the Cover Save. Life After the Cover Save. I didn't actually remember it, but I was like stalling while I thought of it, <laughs> and then I thought of it. Yeah. So Blake, friend of the show, and we've both been on the Life After the Cover Save podcast, which yeah. is a treat. Yeah, we'll link both episodes down and in the show notes below. It is so much fun to be on that podcast. So, they take nothing seriously. Nothing, which is fantastic. Yeah. And I don't think you entirely understood no. how unserious it was going to be. No. It took you like 10 minutes. I to walked be in like, blind. <laughs> I, I had to acclimate. I was hoping that the intro that I created for you, I almost dropped my phone there, uh, that that would get you in the right mindset. Mm-hmm. But I think it only confused you more. <laughs> yeah, I was like, where is this coming from? I don't even know you. And I was like, of course, that was written by John. Yeah, it makes sense. Oh, man. All right. So... We didn't steal it, Blake. We improved it. Okay, there we go. We iterated this, on it. Yeah, this is America. Yeah. We take others' good ideas and make them different. Di- different. <laughs> <laughs> um, first part of the preamble ramble, I bought a cricket. Are you familiar with a cricket? I'm only familiar with it because you showed it to me last time I was here. Yeah, so oftentimes a cricket is bought by uh, lonely housewives who want to make stickers and put them on everything. Um Essentially, what it is is a exacto blade guided by CNC, mm. um, and the possibilities with that are endless. And so, um, you can cut, generally speaking, paper, vinyl, stuff like that. But also, you can cut 0.025 inch thick styrene, Ooh. which is a fa- it's that sounds small, but it is it is fairly substantial. It's good enough for buildings for sure. Okay. And so, I did some little googling. I found this YouTube channel called 40K Ham Slam. Ham Slam. Great name. That is a great name. Um, and he walked me through in two like six minute long videos how to set up a cricket to cut styrene um, for warmer 40K terrain. And I was like, this is so perfectly for me. Oh, um, yeah. And, and it was short and sweet and it was beautiful. So I have this idea for a video that I really wanted to where it's uh, – Terrain makers are so nice in that whenever they make something, they hamstring themselves by using materials that are very cheap or widely available, Right, which is a, a great thing to do. And I think the majority of content should probably focus on that. Mm-hmm. But I'm just curious what would happen if you used every single expensive tool at your disposal. 
So I'm going to use the 3D printer. I'm going to use the Cricut. I'm going to use all these weird tools that I have and just see what kind of crazy sci-fi building I can make that looks hopefully just like a kit that GW might make. Oh, man. Um, so yeah. yeah. You have to do a little little research on the GW terrain aesthetic mm -hmm. too, because it's very it's I don't say it's very defined as an aesthetic, but it is it is distinctly theirs. Mm -hmm. I would be great if you could see how close you could get to make it feel like it was actually one of their kits. Yeah, that'd be sick. Oh, that would be good. Yeah, that's a lot of work to do the design side. Yes, it's a lot of time in Adobe Illustrator putting together pieces, cutting them out, and then messing up and then readjusting the design and all this stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. But if you get those, like if, if you get for your cricket, the ability to make like the kinds of things they put on everything, like their little raised a Aquilas or whatever, yeah. the, little, the little skull with a five pointed star behind Absolutely. it. And stuff, you slap those all over and everyone be like, that's definitely GW. That's what they put on. everything. <laughs> <laughs> a few skulls here. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I'm excited for that video a lot. Okay. Cool. All right. So you got a cricket. Mm -hmm. um, do you think once you're done with that video, you'll ever use it again? It depends on what I'm going to do. So I think for certain applications, it's going to be really helpful, particularly for cutting circles mm. um, and other difficult shapes. There are circle cutters for styrene, but they're not the easiest to use in my experience. Mm -hmm. So that'd be helpful. I think for a display piece, uh, I would, I would definitely use it. So for the display piece that I want to paint called a uh, prey site, um, I would absolutely use that to create the, uh, surrounding, uh, sci-fi area for my, uh, my That's diorama. A good idea. Yeah. I like, I like the palatability of, of using things for very, defined smaller high quality project mm -hmm. as opposed to something we often get into or use as a part of the the convincing ourselves aspect of making a purchase especially a larger one in this hobby yeah is i'm going to use it every single week <laughs> yeah no definitely not yeah and part of the catalyst of me asking you that question is the other day my wife came down into the basement and she looks at the 3d printer sitting there <laughs> on the table and she's like what are you gonna do with that now i'm like I'm going to keep printing stuff like every other day. <laughs> what are you talking about? Have you been? No, I'm all out of resin. I'm waiting <laughs> for my resin to show up. But really the thing that excites me most about the 3D printer moving forward is the gobbledygook stuff that you're talking about with a 3D printing off a cool little tree stump yes. or a, a street lamp yes. or whatever. Yes. And that kind of stuff that is not just so simple or easy to craft on your own but i'm not gonna couldn't like spend so many hours in in working on this on a regular basis absolutely so. like you could scratch build air conditioners as like little greebles to put on things or you could just buy miscast terrain's little sci-fi greebles thing and just print out like 15 yeah. varieties of them and you just kind of boop, 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 stick them everywhere. Yeah, it's just yeah. like, it's so convenient. This window holds four window units. <laughs> <laughs> What's the story behind this? <laughs> I just wanted to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think another thing about the cricket is that there is unknown potential with this thing. Right. So I had an idea for the building about making like bulletproof glass, which sometimes you see in schools has like a grid pattern on it. Mm -hmm. And so I bought this clear acetate and what I'm going to do is I'm going to make scoring lines through it for that design and not cut the whole way through to imitate that, like, like that glass you might see at like a school or something like that. Right. So there's an example that I haven't seen someone use yet for like clear acetate um, to make like a, like a window or something. So it's like, it's really hard to kind of just sit here and surmise like what are all the things I could accomplish with this? But I think there, there's unknown potential. And it hasn't fully been explored yes. in our hobby yet. Yes. You must be the trailblazer. <laughs> okay. Dude, 40K ham slam is the trailblazer, dude. Okay. Well, you're the dude in the back of the wagon going on the Oregon trail. Yeah. Yeah. Saying like, we should go that way. And it's like, shut up guy. <laughs> like, dude, we just broke an axle. You listen to me. <laughs> right. All right. John's secret Santa hall. What's this all about? Oh, we get it. You know, we did that secret Santa thing through uh, the the pit uh, discord group where there's a bunch of Twitch folks that are a part of that and they do a, a big community mini painting secret Santa stuff thing. 
Yep. Okay. Through Impending Duff and Gamer Dad, Zambies, all sorts of goody goody peepees. Okay, let's uh, let's just never say that again. <laughs> goody peepees. Well, then you immediately repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I needed to do it at least one time to experience it. <laughs> yes. You can say you've experienced the goody peepees. <laughs> <laughs> um. So this. SOB beat me to the punch of like start of November, whammo blammo, I get my package in the mail for oh Secret my. Santa. Already. And not only did I get the package, I then got an email from the nice people running the thing and they said, oh, it's it sounds like one of the two packages sent to you was actually sent back to the sender. So they're going to come. They're going to send it again. I'm like, I got more coming. Is two different people or one no? It's one person. They just decided to use two different packages. Oh, my. I don't know why, but <laughs> so I want to share with you what I got. Okay, I got the Ultimate Black 2.0. 2.0. Okay. Okay. The a bottle. It's a pretty nice size bottle. Okay. Of that stuff, and I'm excited to mess with that. Yeah. See how black my black can get. Okay. It's supposed to be really matte and really black. Okay. And that's the thing, because typically when black paint is matte, it looks more like a charcoal gray. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Here's my theory about that. I feel like whenever I mix matte medium into a paint, it lightens it up. Because mm. it has it has something that's white in it. And I people have told me in the past that when it dries, it should dry translucent. But I feel like maybe it doesn't entirely dry translucent. I don't I, I don't know if it's if it's that, and that entirely could be it, or if it's the fact that it's, um, if it creates a matte finish that it affects how, um, you know, how much light is shining back off it. So it affects what your eye views the color as, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it views it as less rich or more desaturated, mm -hmm. or in this case, it makes it feel like it's a little bit more white because that white in there is making it feel desaturated. Okay. Um, cause yeah, like those scale 75 paints. <laughs> um what was that about i'm confused <laughs> that just i they uh they give it like a different look like i'm really i'm really interested in because they look much more realistic i'm just okay. pointing at your woody man here because that was woody also, man um that was done in scale 75 no mixture oh was it mm -hmm. like the green is the, the green scale 75 green is caliban green from gw oh caliban caliban green but the the Sandalwood. Is that a sandalwood? sandalwood. Yeah, the midtone is mostly sandalwood. And then the highlight was uh, your favorite, Vallejo Ice Yellow. No! Not and much of it, though. It, it is mostly, the midtone is mostly there, mostly sandalwood. So, yeah. Okay, you went all over the board then. Oh, yeah, I'm all over, yeah. Huh. I think maybe it's just the, the aspect of the the mixing in the sandalwood throughout that's matting those those mixes a little bit. Yeah, possibly. Um, but you're right. It is a little bit more... I think deep green in the darkest shadows, which I dig. Thank you. Because if that was scale 75, that mini would look like shit. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I got, uh, I got the black 2.0. I also got a bunch of green stuff rollers. Ooh. I, I, I put these on my wish list and I forgot. Oh. Isn't that the best thing? Wait, when did you make the wish list? When you sign up for it, they have mm, questions and they that? have. I don't know, like a month ago. How did was you forget? It? I don't remember. <laughs> I, I forgot immediately. Okay. It's green stuff rollers are one of those things that I always like mean to pick up at a convention because they're green stuff world, um, because they're not in the U.S. From and Spain, it, yeah. Yeah, and it's like I've never quite have had like I want to do a full order of stuff from them. Mm -hmm. I like a bunch of stuff that they do, but I've never gotten around to it. And I've really wanted some rollers, so they got me some cool rollers, nice. some standard cobblestone, some like rickety brickety. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, God damn it! <laughs> rickety brickety, like just like bricks, resin bricks. Well, it's a roller, but it's like the the bricks are kind of like uh, beat up and cracked, and you know, not so nice. That's why they're rickety. Yeah, they're rickety bricketies. Okay, okay. Yeah. Obviously, the description is what it is. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, and then some like uh, like a weird like Cthulhu, um, I don't know, with like arcane symbols and evil things that are you could put on the ground is like it was some part of like a cultist lair or something like that. Nice. That's really cool. Okay. And mine that I'm sending out, this person lives in Iowa, so they're really close. So I like I like did a little 
research on my, who I'm sending this stuff to. Okay. You know, he doesn't live very far away. Who is it? Do you know? Uh, I can't remember his name. I'm not going to say it right now because it may not get to him yet and I don't want to spoil it. Okay. I don't want him to know that there's supposed to be like a grand reveal at the end after like everyone's got all their stuff and you can be like, Hey, it was me. But for most people, it's going to be like, Hey, my name is Bill. I live in Virginia. <laughs> and they'll be like, okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, I went a little bit overboard. So uh, you're supposed to spend minimum $25, which is good. And I spent at least three times that. I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> Because I just kept thinking of more cool stuff. Yes. And then I basically had, I'd spend about like, I don't know, 50 or 60 bucks. And then I was up here and I went to the source and I just kept buying more stuff for oh, him. Boy. So uh, I hope he likes it. I think he will. Cause You're not going to say what, he, what you got. I'm not going to say, but okay. it's 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 good stuff. Because um, some of it is is kind of standard stuff, but some of it, he kind of, I got some indications. He was a little curious on some things he hadn't tried before. Ooh, a little terrain curious. Yeah, a little so, scale curious. Yeah, scale color curious, I think was the <laughs> phrase. And, uh, yeah. But it wasn't scale color, it was about something else. Yes. And so I got him what I considered the greatest starter, starter kit for getting into this realm. Excellent. And we'll call it paints that aren't based with water but they're based with something else mm, based with the g and with an l i don't know what you mean gel medium no 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 what kind of paints would you paint with that don't have water based pigments it's a paint oil yes <laughs> Yes, Scott. Hey, what did I guess before that? Pigments? That you, doesn't have water in it. You guessed gel medium. <laughs> okay, yeah. I thought you were talking about like, yeah, different types of medium paints. Because you're into like gel mediums and stuff like that. <laughs> okay, about the black. Have you painted with it yet? I have not. I'm curious if they got stuff in there, you know, chemical stuff, that's going to make it difficult to paint with, like in a, in a way that we're not familiar with, with typical water-based acrylic hobby paints. Um, from the consistency that it looks in the in the bottle, it looks more like a what I would call a medium body acrylic. Okay. So it's it's a bit more thick, but it's not like a heavy body, just like a spoop it out and it doesn't move at all <laughs> on the thing. So yeah, what's it gonna act like when we thin it down for yeah. our uses? When you try to blend with it or do anything mm -hmm. with it, yeah. So I might have to. I don't know if anyone's done a video on the. Uber black. Someone's got to have. About mini painting related? Uh, yeah, I don't know, but someone has to have. Okay, well, I'm going to look, and if they, no one has, then that's what I'm going to do a video I on. I mean, just do it anyways, because it's, it's your take on it. Yeah, you that's know? true. That's unique to you. I I kind of stress out about that, because I have my, my grand list of video ideas, and like already, and like the list is not short, so I'm, I'm okay, but I'm always already worried about like coming up with unique ideas right? that no one's done before, and no one's... I looked at something this way or in in a light that I think will have a will reach a larger audience. It's kind yeah. of the realm that I'm at right now. Okay. And uh freak out. There's one day I'm gonna wake up. I, I got my own ideas. I mean at the end of the day, you can just paint a model and talk about it. Yeah, that's true. And there are always new models coming out. Are there? Yeah. Oh, constantly. Okay. It's actually kind of a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for me. Oh, <laughs> yes. A yeah, problem for my wallet. <laughs> but, and for my hours in a given week or month or year to actually complete painting <laughs> a number of things. I will say about that I paint more when, since I've started the YouTube channel. Because I always got to be painting something. Well, you don't. Uh, until I'm editing. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you're, you're in certain phases. Yeah. Is it right. an editing day or is it a painting day? Yep. Sometimes, like you asked me the question, like, I made weekly videos when I was full time. How did I do that? I didn't paint miniatures every single week. Sure. I was like, maybe like one in every three weeks was a painted miniature video. Otherwise, it was like about technique or about like a Ooh, thing. About putting your brush to bed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> making a little brush bed. Um, but yeah, that 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 definitely helps. Yeah, soften up the release schedule a little bit. Right. And they're helpful videos that are not like I'm not like punting on them at all. Yeah, right. Yeah. Some of the some of your videos, and I think back to your log that have I have learned the most from. They weren't you painting a video. Uh, painting a video. Painting, painting a miniature. Yeah, you know. So I I, I get that. Mm -hmm. okay, I might have to incorporate that. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. I got. Was there anything else on the? Yeah. Apparently, our Facebook blew up. Uh, something happened to the Trapped Under Plastic Facebook group in the last, uh, I would say, at this point, two and a half, three weeks. The number of requests we are getting to join the Facebook party is astronomical. Heck yeah, dude. Yeah, we got like one billion followers. Okay. Yeah, like that Billie Eilish song. Where's that money coming through? <laughs> uh, Facebook groups give you no dollars. Oh, okay. Well. So we that's okay. <laughs> So I was, you know, we were getting over a hundred, you know, some days two hundred re- uh, requests a day. What the fuck? Yeah, yeah. I I didn't understand it. I'm like, and I'm like, what is this all bots and stuff? No, they're ninety nine point nine percent all real people. Did our did our did the, like the videos somewhere like kind of like you see a spike somewhere? I in checked the analytics? that too. I checked that too. Stay as she goes. Uh, there, we got an uptick, but not a major one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, not a major one, but like our last episode, we were like in, I think like a week and a half, we were over a number of views from what our average is from videos that are, you know, six, seven, eight months old. Okay. So that might trend that we're, we're going up. I don't know what it is. Maybe the word has spread. Sometimes, you know, you get the second hand information mm-hmm. and that, that second tier of folks that maybe didn't know about us, but we our first tier has grown sizable enough that we get more word of mouth or it's spreading to other nooks and crannies of the internet. Nooks um, and crannies. So at this point, I decided to recruit <laughs> two people to be moderators in the group, and that is Josh and Blair, and they're in my Dungeons and Dragons group, so I didn't let them leave the D&D session without... Uh, accepting moderator responsibilities <laughs> in the Facebook group. If you want to continue role playing with me, you have to mod my Facebook group. Yes. <laughs> uh, they said yes super quick, so I'm like, no, this is an easy sell. <laughs> all right, nice. Um, I'm like, all you have to do is check on if people are being jerks, which is almost never happens, you know, and make sure that they're real people that are applying and they're like, yeah. good. And then Blair was like, you should probably have like a question or two that they have to fill out before they get in here. I'm like, that's why I hired you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, see, this is all, this is about delegation of power now. I'm like, right. Blair, right. why don't you come up with one or two good questions yeah. that we can use? You know, not too specific. We don't want to be, you know, exclusive, but just so we know we get the riffraff out. Like a tendy question, maybe? <clears throat> I don't know what that was that I just did. <laughs> I was trying not to cough. But I, I thought my brain would explode if I didn't. <laughs> Got a little bit out. Let's steam out, dude. Yeah, I was thinking something along the lines of like, um, what's your favorite paint brand? Fine. You don't have to be like, you know the inner workings of Trapped Under Plastic in okay. order to join. Okay. okay. And like, you need to know all the inside jokes. Okay. Like, finish this sentence. Meat and... <laughs> That's actually probably a pretty good question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but... It doesn't accomplish the goal that you wanted to accomplish by being kind of more of a general question. Right. Sure. Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. All right. So that's it. So we got two people. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Blair. Thanks, that's Blair. the last time I'll ever say those words. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't we painted. What do we paint? Let's see. What is this? This, I believe, is uh, his name a is miniature. He- <laughs> True. Can't deny that. His name is Hiragard. Uh, he's from the Cult of Paint Kickstarter, which is. Is it going to be active? Yeah, it'll be yeah. active when this podcast launches on Monday. Um, this guy comes in a variety of scales. You can get him in the 1 to 12 scale bust, or you can get him in the 54 millimeter scale full figure Oh, with his little fawny fawn legs. Oh, he does have fawn legs. Yeah, he's carrying a decapitated head. And Goat he's got boy. Sword oh, he's shoulder. the decapitated head guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's him, but in a smaller scale. Yeah, I painted him. I don't paint a lot of busts. This is bust number four. Uh, for me and man painting bus is great uh, it's mm-hmm. so it's so much fun i want to just draw our attention to his cheek he has like three muscle groups he has like he has the cheek right mm-hmm. he has this lower jaw area that flares out and then he has like this muscle right here mm-hmm. do you see it near his ear yeah little... i was pointing to it but the headphones are <laughs> <that point. laughs> okay that's what you're doing i was like you're like yeah big brain painting <laughs> <laughs> um, but painting this model is so much fun just because there's just like per, I don't know, per surface area, there's so much more going on in terms of volumes. Right. And it was just a lot of fun. Just, I could, I really could have just sat here and just kind of like glazed and did little wet blends and feathered for like an eternity. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very enjoyable. 
so I had fun painting it and I kind of discovered the narrative of the character as I was painting it. The only thing I knew when I walked into painting this model was that I wanted to do a green shadow and I wanted to use sandalwood because in the past I've used sandalwood and a blue shadow on my vampires and that works out really well to create this mm -hmm. dead looking flesh. And I was like, okay, let's work with green. So I tried it with green and it works okay. I um, think it's a very, it makes a very unique and interesting skin tone that still reads to my eye as green. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a lot of fun doing it with the spider webs and all that stuff. Uh, I did at first with the spider webs try to do the traditional method of getting spider webs, which is spraying crackle medium through sure. an airbrush, but it wasn't working uh, for me. Um, maybe because I, I thinned it too much. Uh, it's worked in the past, but I couldn't get it to work. Really? And then I thought I remember someone doing this on a large scale using uhu glue. Yeah. And I was wondering what I, I this was. It, I think it works okay. It's a little too thick, but that's all right. It could even be like, when I look at it, it looks like spider webs in the morning when there's dew on them. Yeah. There's a little, a little bit of a glint. Of, yeah. Maybe. I like that. So that's what your story is now. Yes. It's morning. It's morning. It's, it's dewy. His name is Dewey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think he looks great. So this is your fourth bust. Fourth bust. Yeah. I painted Red Alabama, the vampire. Mm -hmm. I painted Hellboy for my mom. Me mom. And I painted that... Darth Core Krieg bus, a ah, 3D yes. print. This is number four. That is four more than I have ever painted. It's a lot of fun. I, you're gonna yeah. paint one for your mom, right? Yes. I am. Um, yeah. Well, I take that back. When we were in wizard school, um, yeah, 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 yeah. We painted a head of one. So I, yeah, I painted face. a bit of it. Yeah, but yeah. that was so. That was so fun. It is. Um, and I'm excited to use a bunch of loaded brush on it. Ooh. Like, I think that's such a good kind of model to use loaded brush on because you get so many little volumes that you can just mm -hmm. hammer out with that. So. Yeah, Ben's got that excellent bust painting series where he uses no airbrushes at all and paints mm -hmm. an entire bust. And I'm guessing he uses a bit of loaded brush in that video. He He's um, notorious for not liking airbrushing at all. Yeah, he, yeah, he does not like it. Like, even so far as to he won't even prime his stuff with an airbrush if he can help it. Okay. Uh, because he's just like, it's just so much easier for me to go over the out the back porch and go. Shh, it is. Shh. It is. It's less. It's less fussy yeah. for sure. And he's been doing this for so many years to such a high level that he probably is like, I respect that other. I'm just putting words into his mouth. I respect <laughs> that other people do that that way. This works great for me. The another way, and it allows me to yeah. get working what I want to work on. Yep, confidence in um, his process for sure. And I also uh, love John, and he's a great person. Yeah, and, and I, I want to be his friend. I want to be his friend. I want him to come hang out with me and uh, uh, make painting Buddha videos 2.0. Yeah, I think know. he did say all of that yeah. for sure when we when we saw him last time. Yeah, he when said he was all that. Hanging out down here in the basement with us. Yeah, and he was like, I don't want any of the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we'll just. Well, he doesn't buy. want any of the credit either. Actually, he wanted to paint the bus and then say that we painted it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He's like, we'll just superimpose your hand in the yeah. video afterwards. Yeah. 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 And then he said, well, we're going to take the money uh, and buy a McDonald's play place. <laughs> I don't know why. A, a, a miniature themed McDonald's play place. Right. So it's like, like big bottles of like droppers and like. Yeah. Instead of a ball pit, it's just G, just like GW pots of paint yeah yeah maybe like a big old space marine hanging out somewhere yeah you know chad yeah the space marine is like like has just decapitated ronald mcdonald and he's holding <laughs> him up his yeah. head yeah yeah and all, all the condiments are replaced with paints instead so instead of ketchup you get uh uh, uh blood for the blood gut uh i was trying to think of a fucking I was trying to think of a red paint. <laughs> Elizar, <laughs> I can't think El of a single red paint. Elizar and Crimson. Uh, Mephiston you know, red? Mephiston maybe? red, yeah. You know, and yellow is yeah. a different color. <laughs> <laughs> and from the outside, it doesn't look like the McDonald's with the glass. It's just a big drop pod. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, in fact, it's the drop pod that he made in his diorama right. with someone living inside of it. Yeah. Instead of living inside of it, we're all playing in the playhouse yeah 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 instead of the little tables on the side where you can eat with your fam and your kids eat like two french fries because they're so excited to go in the play place it's little painting setups where you can Ooh, paint with the lights lamps. yeah yeah and you get like instead of food trays what comes out is like a giant wet palette tray <laughs> 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 they're all masters you know those fucking huge ones yeah yeah you get one of those big boys and it's got your food on there and you go set it down at your little painting station and then you go hang out in the ball pit with ben this sounds <laughs> and he just like, floats around in the ball pit <laughs> like you're like in the ball pit you like hit something and it's like ben just like ah! 
Oh, hello. <laughs> this is some fucking fever dream here, buddy. <laughs> we need to make this a reality. No, no, absolutely not. I mean, when this podcast makes it so big that we have three Teslas each. Okay. Then we'll invest all our money into this. Yeah, okay. And then people can come from all over the world yes. and play in the painting play place. Wait, 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 wait. Is McDonald's a franchisable restaurant? Yes. So we could open our own McDonald's. But it's not open to the public. So we constantly have Private to like McDonald's. push people away. Okay. Because they come up and open the doors and they go through the drive through window and not they're open. like, no. Yeah. Uh, you have to like answer these questions three in order for you to come into the door. <laughs> what is the airspeed velocity of an unladen <laughs> swallow? African or European? <laughs> no. Red. No, green. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's what I painted. <laughs> okay. What did I paint? A kill oh. team, right? Yeah, I did two different things. I painted a kill team for an exciting collaboration that I have coming up. Ooh. Um, unlike the world has ever seen. Ooh. <laughs> and I'm not going to talk any more about that. Okay. I, this is not really even a secret, but I'm just making it a secret All to right. hype build yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Uh, so I built a kill team and, well, no, I didn't build it. I specifically <laughs> did not build it. Because, so we started on lies. Well, yes, completely on lies <laughs> because it was built and, and mailed to me to paint. And due to some... Postal service issues coming from the great land of Canada. Mm. Uh, I ended up having about a three, no, four day, four full day turnaround where I needed to get it back in the mail to oh, them. Oh boy. <coughs> so can you tell us what race this, the kill team is? Space Marines. Of course. Can you tell us what scheme you used? Or is it all secret? How much of this is a secret? I, I know it's, that's not a secret. Okay. I, can't remember it's a it's not a it's not like a you a know like one. Bo bougie no it's not un, it's not unknown um i'm just buying time right here what's the color tell me the color i'll guess it it's uh darkish blue and like cream oh boy okay i have no idea uh, i was gonna guess night lords at first but i don't crimson not crimson fist that's red no it's like uh something angels i think Dark Angels. <laughs> not that. No, it's not Dark Angels. <laughs> angels Revenant. Angels Revenant. Because okay. the name was badass. Okay, yeah, I like that. And the Angels Revenant play a big part. God damn it, I'm just admitting that I looked up lore right now. Oh, oh yeah, you have a problem with this, don't you? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the Angels Revenant play a big part in the story of surrounding Dark Imperium. Okay. Dark Imperium is that the newest box? Uh, I think that's the second to newest box. No, then it's it's whatever is the newest one. What's the newest one that just came out with the Necrons? You're supposed to know this. You have it over there. I don't know. Anyway, so <laughs> they play a, a big role in it, and maybe I'm wrong. I'm gonna go that quick. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Dark Imperium is not the right answer, but we're just looking like Chumbalones right now. Keep talking about your, about your squad. Okay, so it's uh, I had to paint six models. And it kind of was a way for me to get creative and how I could make them look as cool as I could make them look in basically three days. And I don't have a lot of experience painting space Marines. And I will fully admit, and I told Steve this after I, you know, when I was finishing them up that Steve, who's Steve? I can't tell you any more than that. Okay. Yeah. I can't tell you any more than that. If you, if you can put, if you can piece together these clues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the Nurgle and Primaris, Ultramarines, Dark Ultramarines. Imperium. It's not That's Dark okay. Imperium. All right, just keep talking. Look at the box. Okay, you can get the box. <laughs> oh, you're fucking connected. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I hope you didn't break everything there. Well, the mixer is good, so we're fine. I'm super loud now, though, so I think you probably came unplugged. Um, I admitted to Steve that I really enjoyed painting the Primaris Marines. They have such nice big volumes. Of, of like really basic shapes. There's so many. What are those? What's that shape? Cone, not cones. Spheres. No. Volumes? Cylinders? It, cylinders. Yeah, they're, like, the they're all cylinders. There's so range. many cylinders. Yeah. There's so many cylinders. And I enjoyed doing it because I, I was like, you know, I'm going to make this quick, fun, and dirty. And uh, 
I'm going to show you a picture right now. I I can I can show this picture on the screen. Okay. Once uh, to all the sprues and spruettes. So what the box I have is called Indominus, but In, that, that's not the name of the starter set. Yeah. Um, I'm it's something else. Messing this up really bad. We're figuring it out. Yeah. Okay. So what are you going to show me right now? I mean, I'm going to show you what the what they look like. Okay. So they're a little bit darker than mm -hmm. than ultramarines in terms of the blue. For, yeah, you painted this in three days. Yeah, in the evenings. Yeah. Did you add a glow to this mod? Th these paint jobs? A little bit. A little glow. A little bit. I mean, yeah, this looks fantastic. Um, ooh, ooh, the pink plasma. Oh yeah, baby. Yeah, that it was. It was okay. So the tough part was that I had to knock this out while still painting a giant ass dragon, which is the other thing I painted. And that thing is uh, eight inches tall, ten inches wide, and ten inches long. Is the size of that dragon. Jeez Louise. Um, and it was just massive. 3D print from Danny, our boy's Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And beautiful model, beautiful sculpt. Really excited to paint it. Um, and I slapped that thing together with, we'll talk about um, in the after party, new things we tried. Um, the video should be out now, but I tried a new kind of painting technique of speed painting. I don't even want to necessarily call it speed painting, but painting something relatively quickly um, without using an airbrush at all. So okay. so those are the two things I painted. The yeah. dragon, I don't love how the dragon turned out, but for roughly five, four or five hours of work, something that for that, big. something that big and not use an airbrush, I'm, I'm pretty happy. That's crazy. It's, it, it's, it's pretty cool. The coolest thing about it is that where I stopped, so it's basically a two-step process, and then... It's really easy to continue to do more easy steps to keep kind of ticking up how much you want the final quality to look like. And you can stop at any point along the way. But the basics of it is pretty quick and pretty fun to to achieve. So Okay. So those are the those are the two things that I painted. I look forward to that video. Yeah. Both videos, in fact. You did a nice job getting a nice infinite black on that in that photo. Oh. Thank you. I'm trying to, I struggle like I struggle with mini painting photography. It, I think everyone does. It's just something I, like I do too sometimes. Yeah. Thank you. You do. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but trying to, and that, this is with my new setup at home with my, my silly curtains. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you can have the curtain and you just swoop it over a card table at an angle. And then you put the miniatures right at the front end. So you're trying to push them far back from that, that black mm -hmm. swoop. And then you get the camera right in front uh, as close. Well, not as close as you can, but yeah. anyway. You can mask off the light too. So it doesn't light up the background. It just keeps it mostly black. So like I'll like take like little scrims and, and block the light. That's so it's smart. Yeah. That makes it easy. You don't got to do a whole lot of editing. That's a good idea. Um, so, okay. I looked up this thing. That's why I've been on my phone. And the starter sets are called the Warmer 40K Command Edition, Elite Edition, and Recruit Edition. And they're different price ranges, but they don't have like a name. Like Dark Imperium had a name and Indominus has a name. Yeah. You can't buy Indominus anymore. It was like a limited edition thing. And Dark Imperium isn't. That was that was the starter set for 40K. So there really isn't a name for the starter set anymore. I don't understand so was, these I how this world works even. I was like wasting my time. Yeah, I like how you, you <laughs> looked into that so deeply <laughs> for something that I in inevitably screwed up in my description of it. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's what we painted. All right. The topic for today... Talking about local game stores. And this was a question from one of our patrons name who is Jay. And Jay is a game store owner. Name who is Jay? <laughs> and uh, he was curious, like, what details about a local game store or LGS, if we say that in the future of this, this episode, uh, what features kind of make you prefer one store to the other or prefer to shop at a store versus online? How can you set yourself apart as a game store owner? And a little caveat for you, uh, deep dive, like me and John are two kinds of customers, right? Sure. That does not represent the entirety of your customer base. So like sure. if you live in an area where like 90% of the kids are playing magic, you should probably have magic cards, even though that maybe I might not buy them that, you know, you should definitely be able to analyze your demographic and figure out what they're buying and then buy those products so you can sustain yourself instead of buying a bunch of weird crap that we might suggest. Um, so take our opinions with a little bit of a grain of salt, uh, considering that. 
Yeah. I mean, from a general retail perspective, because you and I both worked retail, right? Yep. We're both best buyers. Ooh, yeah, baby. Geek Squad. No. No, I was with I was I was with the alcoholics in the home entertainment yeah, area. Honestly, <laughs> those guys were the funniest guys. Oh yeah, um, you're gonna sell TVs, man. Yeah, you gotta be. You're a smooth right, talker. Yeah, you gotta be the right kind of <laughs> schmoozer. Um, and we didn't make any commission too. That was the, the, you have to be this. No one did. You have to have this right combination of being a good salesman and stupid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I worked at the computer floor and the in the photo section for like a little bit because like they debated me into working for Geek Squad. They're like, yeah, you you can work there, but do you want to start at computers? And I was like, oh, okay, sure. A year goes by and I'm still working on, on the computer sales floor. I'm like, what the fuck's happening? Thing. and that's why i complained and then i got to go to geek squad um but yeah yeah retail anyways yeah so i think we've and i'm probably most of this roots and threads have worked retail or you worked in hospitality that kind of stuff where you know there's a certain level of understanding and expectation of what that works like that the kind of thing so there's there's two things you can go through to be successful two routes you can take there's probably others but these are the two main ones i'm going to talk about <laughs> One is you do one thing and you do that thing really, really well. Yeah. And people come to you because you do that. Yep. AKA Raisin Canes. Mm. All they do is tendies and fries and that's all they need to do. Yep. Texas toast. Yeah. Every single meal is like a permutation of those things. Yeah. It's three things and there's a little slaw in there too, but yeah. that's fine. But if you do one thing so well, it doesn't matter that you don't have a lot of things. Very true. But that doesn't work for a game store. Mm. here's why okay in our hobby even if we expand it to you know not only um miniatures but the miniature war games themselves and the wide variety of those games that their companies are out there it's still such a niche thing there's very few communities where that is going to sustain you to be a successful business that's why you also do magic cards yeah that's why you also do board games. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why you also do D&D. &D. And comics what, and everything. Yes. And then you get into comics. And and it's a lot of places will do like uh, video games or, or retro video games and all that kind of stuff too. So they're all cousins to each other in this nerddom where we, we're, we're not too far removed from, from one or the other. And it's also closely enough associated that if I play... Um, Star Wars X-Wing and I come to the store to buy Star Wars X-Wing and I come to the store to play Star Wars X-Wing I am close enough associated with that hobby that I might join other hobbies that are sold there as well mm -hmm. yeah, I might go from there to Imperial Assault from Imperial Assault to Warhammer 40k Yeah, and so we have to cast a little bit more of a wider net when we're talking about um, friendly local game stores about what you offer. Well, they have to. We don't have to. No, we don't have to. Yeah. So but, th this is what we want in a game store. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm getting to that very slowly. Okay. Apparently. Okay. 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 Right. So the first thing of, of what I really think you need more than about anything um, to have a successful, friendly local game store is really good communication and really good listening about what your local community wants. And how you can help them with that. If you just close your eyes and just keep buying magic cards and you don't support the 40K community that's growing, you are shooting yourself in the foot for not only the success of your business, but also the ability to um, support and grow what your community could be. So that's a big thing. And that's something that I don't see happen all all the time some some stores are good at it, some aren't it's like keep your ear open listen to what people want see what see what's half trending do your research find out what's going on online find out what's happening in other similar size cities stores around there build the network and that kind of stuff and so yeah you just kind of said a million things that i want to like deep dive on like each one of those things okay so you're so in terms of community building that that's something that an online web store really can't do Right, so if you sell GW products, if you sell uh, Malifa products, um, and no one's buying them, which is hard to believe for GW, but you you need to create a reason for people to want to buy them. So create mm -hmm. a weekly Malifa night where you play. You uh, maybe one of the people in your community is uh, I forget the term, but Malifa uh, weird has like a, a system where they have like people who are like representatives for their for their game. They get paid in like discounts and product and stuff like that. 
Mm-hmm. See if you have one of those in your community. Cause I think there's like a way to look them up via map on their, on that website. And then you can, you can get that person roped in and involved running events in your store, like once a month or once a week, when you create the need and the desire for someone to buy something, they're going to, they're going to buy it. Otherwise it, they're just a bunch of cool models and you, you're kind of relying on people's curiosity to get into things. So yeah, community events are friggin' huge. I love them. Um, painting community events are not really a big thing. Mm. Um, at least in the in the local game stores around here. So if you like, if you want to have more of a, I guess we shouldn't be saying, I shouldn't be speaking generally. I should I should be speaking from what I actually want. Okay, it'd be very cool to have some kind of weekly or monthly painting event, whether it's someone running some sort of class, and the models come from the local game store, and the paints come from there. It's a way to drive sales to your product in there, mm-hmm. um, and you can pay the person teaching the class for their time and stuff like that. So some kind of like weekly or monthly painting event would be really cool because typically most of the events going on at a store are gaming driven. Yeah. And this is an area that I've seen and, and I've heard a fair amount of, of other uh, painters and hobbyists complain about, and that is really that the game store uh, really taking a priority in the community building itself. And that doesn't mean that me at the game store, I need to know everything about every game so I can run all these great events I need to be able to build a network of committed players and enthusiasts in my area that I can trust them to enough to say, okay, what would you want a monthly event to look like for yeah. your game? Yeah. How can I support you in you being able to run that? It's like, what do you need from me? Okay. Um, we need some gift certificates. Okay. We need to make sure we have table space open for you mm-hmm. for this. We need to work on the calendar. Um, we can prom- help promote it through our you know stores, Facebook group and stuff like that. Like you need to build those relationships because this is a small business. You don't have probably a dozen employees even. Yeah. You need to be able to use the resources that you have. And that is the awesome people in your community. Yeah. And you need to empower them to be able to let them lead something successfully. Yeah. And that's a big thing, you know, and oftentimes as you know, when you're a small business owner, you kind of feel like you have to rely on yourself for all the answers and and you need to be able to be, um, kind of really holding close because you're the one whose neck is on the line. Yep. But so often I see places just go under because they don't take advantage of the great people in our community Mm -hmm. to help them succeed. And that's just it. It's like. I want you to guys to, if you guys are excited about Star Wars Legion, I want you to be excited. I want to help. How can I help? Mm-hmm. You know, that's so, really awesome. That's a big one. Yeah. You know, on that note, it'd be really cool if like, because one of the hardest things about getting together a group of gamers to play something is just that getting them together and organizing the whole thing. So like, what if like, uh, say kill team, cause kill team has been on my mind lately. What if they made like, four kill team groups you know a b c and d and you could like sign up to be in one of these groups and they told you when to show up and told you when your game was and told you who you who you were playing against or like maybe like someone was assigned in your group to have that responsibility it'd be very cool if they like had like a a structure for uh for setting that up and and playing that so you didn't have to think about you know you didn't have to find friends or find random people to play with you they'd be doing that work because they are the central location where everyone is going to in the first place Right. That'd be kind of fun. Yeah. I, I think that when we talk about what makes a friendly local game store either stand out from its competitors in the same market or differentiate itself from online shopping, which is surely a bigger competitor from, yeah. from the most part. And that is at the end of the day, you have to be able to be the place that's got the community mm. and people will spend money and they'll spend a little bit more if they can come to your store because they know you know, the new friends they've made and their friends that do play the game, we can go there and play. It's a little bit harder right now in these COVID times. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. In terms of playing. But I think you can still do the, take that time and effort that you worried about uh, building that and getting that going within your walls and trying to um, find ways to keep it going when people can't, you know, come to your store and play. You know, and that could be... Um, painting competitions through your store's Facebook group. That could be, Ooh, um, yeah, that's a good one. You know, li- list building and, and show me what you've done, you know, in, in your army that, so when the, you know, the COVID you know, winter ends, when we can come back again, you know, what have you 
what army have you built or what army did you decide to play? What That's army really did cool. you paint? You need to keep interacting with them because they, if you, those community ties weaken, um, that is your biggest threat to your business. You need to keep the community ties strong, keep the communication open and always be listening to again, back to this. You guys aren't coming into my store as much anymore because you can't play your games here. Um, how can I reach out to you to find out what do you need? You know, what, what would help you, you know, what is stressing you out that the hobby could help with and how can I help you with that? So, um, you have to get creative as a business owner right now in this current climate. At the end of the day, it's about keeping your community strong within your store. Yeah. The one thing you just said about like making a, a list building kind of like meetup or something like that was you should look at conventions like Adepticon and look at what kind of classes they have and not just like hobby ones, but also like gaming ones as well. Mm -hmm. And you should find people in your community that are capable of like running like small versions of those classes. So like for instance, Joe Cryer might be able to run some kind of like list building class for Age of Sigmar in this area. Maybe it's like two hours long, it's on a weekend, like whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just fun and people can get together and they can discuss those things. Um, so like, yeah, look, look at conventions for like the framework for like what kinds of classes or events you could run in your, in your game store. You could kind of change them up a little bit. They don't need to be exactly the same um, or whatever. Mm -hmm. When we think about, you know, at the end of the day, uh, what, what is a convention compared to what is a local game store that also has playing space? <laughs> They're not a whole lot different. It's like a mobile game store. It, it is. It, it just has more options, more stuff, more yeah. diversity and things to, br to buy. Um, but also they have the classes there, you know, yes. and, and at a convention. And that's a big draw to, for people. Mm -hmm. So if a big draw for people will come from all over the country, all over the world to a convention, and that's one of the big draws for it. In addition to tournaments, well, you can do tournaments at your store. There's a draw and for us. People do, yeah, definitely. Yep. You can do leagues. Mm, That's a draw. I love leagues. You know, you can do classes. And even now with COVID, you can do Zoom classes yes. or Discord classes or whatever. But if you're the catalyst for why those things are happening, it doesn't mean you're running 100% of, of, of the, the work to do it. Mm -hmm. You still have those, uh, you know, those content experts that you are leaning on. But you are the catalyst for the, all that happening, and people are going to recognize that, and they are going to support you for it. You know, so that's a big one yeah. for me. Okay. Another thing you mentioned was uh, doing your research, and I feel like this is a huge thing. If you have your finger on the pulse of what hobby stuff is cool and what hobby stuff is, you know, not, not, not just what's just what's cool. Um, Buying, uh, reaching out to those manufacturers and getting that product in store is another huge reason why I would shop at a store over an online store. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, um, Gamergrass, Green Stuff World, uh, probably even Pegaso and Chimera Models, they have a distribution system set up such that you can reach out to them and get product from them at a discount and then obviously sell it in your store for profit. Um, and, like, I would love it if if I ever wanted to buy gamer grass product, if I didn't need to get it shipped from Spain or from Italy, I just go to the yeah. store and get it. So paying attention to what people want in the hobby is a huge thing. Um, there's so many different types of like niche little things that come from different places that it would be so convenient to have it in one central location where I don't have to pay for shipping. Yeah. And that's a tough thing from a retail side of, you know, shelf space and, and your money held up and stuff like that. I don't know. Is it, I feel like, there is so much wasted space at game stores on products that I would be like, this is not good. Like you do not need to sell this either. A it's not a good product or B it's no one's ever heard of it. And no one knows what it does. No one's going to buy it. So I feel like, I feel like it's just making the most of the space you have with the right kinds of products, which I realize is kind of an opinion, but I feel like there's a lot of wasted space in certain stores. Yeah. Yep. And that you're right. This is where you have a research and you have your content expert. Yeah. This is dude. Every game store that I've ever been to that has magic cards has the magic card dude, <laughs> right? The dude that works there, that is the magic card nut. Yeah. They all have one. Okay. That is a tried and true business method in what you need to do to make money on magic, 
to keep the magic community going, making sure you're having your Friday night magic, making sure you're having your every other week draft, making sure you're having all these other things, staying in touch with Wizards of the Coast for your store to get all the, the swag stuff and all these things. Like The magic dude knows that. The magic dude knows how they can best benefit from their magic community, how they can build their magic community, all that kind of stuff. The problem is almost every game store doesn't have magic dude for their other stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? I don't have, I don't have, they don't have like the hobby hero or uh, the comic book guy. I mean, some do, some don't. Yeah. It, I mean, comic books is comic books is a little bit different. I mean, there is some decision. I mean, I don't know comic books. So I probably shouldn't even talk about it. But like, you know, there's decision of which comics you carry and don't carry that are on the monthly release and stuff like that. But um, and how much of an old stock you keep for the old stuff. But anyway, um, but yeah, the people that really know the hobby side, maybe they're not an awesome Age of Sigma or 40K player, but they really know the hobby side. And the people that really know the D&D side, D&D is a major thing. It's not just, well, whatever, again, whatever Wizards of the Coast puts out in a new book, we carry that. No, there's so much third-party stuff out there. There's so many cool tchotchkes and game-related stuff in the D&D RPG realm that the difference between people not knowing that that was something they'd love and they come to your store and they buy it anyway, or you just never see that money. Those mm -hmm. are ones and zeros. <laughs> so it's the role-playing game side and the uh, war gaming side and the hobby side. Those are all some major aspects that you need. You need an expert. You need someone that's passionate about it. Yeah. Okay. If you don't have, say, let's say uh, it's just me and my brother that own the store. Okay. Neither of, we know that we want to have Warhammer. We know we want that community to grow. We know we want to be good at that, but neither of us, that's our jam. That's where I said, you need to, you need to foster a community and build a relationship where you trust somebody that's, you know, in your community that you can ask them, you know, like what's coming up. What, what are there other things? Are there like, are there mats? Should I be buying like mats from third party companies? Should we buy tokens? Yeah. Like what are the things should we be getting? And because they're a content expert and passionate about it, you know, they'll, they'll either tell you or they'll look into it because it's something they care about. And so they'll be like, yeah, I think we should. And, and as long as they understand, this isn't ju just about like us carrying thing that you think is cool. It's us carrying a thing that will be beneficial for the customers, but also help us as a store be profitable and be uh, have value for the community. Mm. And if they have value, people are going to come in our doors and they're going to spend more money. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another thing I like about stores is uh, layout. Um, it, so when you walk into a game store, oftentimes it can be, I don't want to call it like, it's not shocking or anything, but it's hard to find what you want. And there are a few things that I've seen in other stores that I really like and would love if other stores did it too. And then uh, one, one in particular is having an area for new board games and new products. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I do whenever I go to the stores, I, I peruse the GW stuff, but I also go to this, this uh, I don't know what you call it. It's like a shelf or whatever that has all the new board games that they just bought in like the last week or two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I rotate around it and check out all the cool art on the covers and see if I recognize any of the games and stuff like that. And then obviously they have their Malifaux area, they have their Steamforged area, they have their GW area, they have their new GW area. It's all laid out very nicely and, and it's really easy to find stuff. And you can kind of like walk through each section of the store um, and it's like a it's like a hobby kind of experience because mm -hmm. you get a taste of everything in these nice categorized areas. So I think layout for a store is really helpful for ease of shopping, for your customers uh, and enjoyment and... I don't know. It makes it easier for me to buy stuff because I know where I, want, I know where I want to go when, I, when I'm looking for something specific. Right. I think you touched on something that uh, is related to what I want to talk about, and that is um, the stock of your store. Okay. If I one of my biggest pet peeves is when a game store tells me, "Yeah, but we can order that for you." Oh yeah, that's not. That's... Bitch, I can order it for myself for cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now. If I am a if Bitch. I <laughs> if I'm a loyal customer and I want to support you, you put on the games that I like to play. We have table space, you know. You you really value your customers, you know. I, I'll I'll order through you. I'll I'll you know place a special order. Blah blah blah. But I'm probably not coming into your store often enough to create that relationship with you, to make that order, 
If you don't carry shit in your stock, that's the thing that pisses me off so much. Okay. <laughs> if you are a store and you are running on such razor thin margins that your shelves and, and everything is just kind of like, meh, there's just not enough stuff there. Maybe you shouldn't have gotten into this business. Yeah, in the first place. Right? You need to be able to walk in there. I want to see floor to ceilings crap. <laughs> Prime example of this. Obviously, the source we're talking about, the source. Source has just got a bazillion things. But I went to, in Sam's neck of the woods in Kenosha, Wisconsin, I went to Chimera Games. Kenosha? Yeah. I think it's not. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Okay. I thought it was in Kenosha. Somewhere in Wisconsin. Oh, it was in Appleton. Yeah. Appleton, Wisconsin. Sorry, Kenosha. <laughs> Sorry, Appleton. Um <laughs> Camara Games, one of those like you walk up to. It's in like a kind of a strip mall. It's kind of got a the narrow kind of. You walk in and it's like oh, from the door, it's only like six feet on either side. And you walk in and it's just a hallway <laughs> that goes on for infinity, <laughs> and there is shit floor to ceiling everywhere. Yeah. And there, there's like three feet between the shelves because it's so packed. You could have to like walk sideways if there's another person in the aisles because there's so much stuff. There was. M- like new inbox model kits and and blister packs and um, used army stuff and stuff in plastic bags from 40k and Age of Sigmar and Warhammer Fantasy from like 25 years ago, floor to ceiling everywhere. And I was just like, oh my god. <laughs> and I'm not saying your store needs to carry all sorts of old stuff like they do, but they probably had eight, ten different brands of paint. They probably had they had they had more mini painting paintbrush brands than I had ever seen. They were carrying Windsor and Newtons. Why would they carry Windsor and Newtons? Because they probably trusted someone that said the, the brushes, real, the brushes. Holy shit. Yeah. In a glass case with their fancy stuff, but they had it. It was like the kinds of things where I'll buy a $15 Windsor oh, Newton man. from them. I would love it. If a hobby store had a Kalinsky hair sable brush that right. None of them have it. It's right. yeah. That'd be amazing. This is also a really important part of your business model. Um, don't underestimate how much money people will spend because they're already there. Oh yeah. It happens. I, I like our local store. I swear to God, the reason they can keep their doors open is because they keep stocking the pre-painted D and D minis in a box where you don't know what's in there. And their biggest thing is their D and D crowds for their weekly game nights. And they have two or three nights a week. Well, until they just recently shut down because of COVID again. <laughs> Because you got 50 people in there playing D&D on a given night. <laughs> God damn idiots. Anyway, <laughs> um, so people, it's impulse buys. Well, I need some minis. Oh, there's a this is a supplement from a third-party company. I'm going to check that. I'm going to buy that. People buy crap because they're there, and so they'll support you. Yes. It's impulse buys. Yeah. And if your shelves are few and far between and they're not very high-stocked, you're not going to get those impulse buys. Yeah, absolutely not. And those impulse buys are how you, you become a, a profitable business. You know, it's not just because people pre-ordered the new Warhammer books from you. Yeah. That's just not enough. Yeah. I think um, I had a video where I walked through a local game store and kind of just experienced each aisle one at a time. Yeah. And yeah. So I mentioned earlier how you kind of need to have your, your finger on the pulse of what's good to have and what's not good to have. But that's only partially true because I feel like. There's just so much crap at Hub Hobby that I <laughs> never knew existed and never knew that I wanted. And that's kind of a hard thing to know, right? It's like, how do I buy something that even the customer doesn't even know that they want? Right. I mean, I think it just comes down to knowing knowing your audience, knowing what they want to buy. Because, um, like, yeah, when I walk through each of those aisles, each aisle is a different hobby. And it's like I get to experience this small ecosystem. Because one thing I mentioned in that video is while the internet has way more choice and, and you're never able to beat the internet in terms of choice, the convenience is it's, it's all right in front of my face right here. Right. It doesn't take me years and YouTube videos and research to figure out like what is the right thing to buy. I can just, I, I get to see a small snippet of that in each aisle. And it's, it's so, it was so cool to experience that. Um, I don't know how this is, how I'm going to turn this into a suggestion, but I think trying to, trying to, facilitate and foster that experience would be a really cool thing that I would personally enjoy in a store. I think the act of perusing is what you're doing there. Yes. And nerds perusing nerd stuff will find something that they need. Absolutely. Your example in Hub Hobby is like what really resonates with us as hobbyists. Yeah. Because we're looking through each of those, 
you know, shelves through the lens of our mini painting hobby. Absolutely, yeah. I know it says that this is the USS Carolina, <laughs> but in my head, I see a bazillion Greeblies for, <laughs> yeah. you know, Warhammer train. So it's just great to look at it through that lens. But because they're all nerds, it's not a far stretch between what they're really interested in and what cool thing they didn't know existed before. Yeah. Now they got to have it. Yeah. You know, and that's it. They need to... You need to excite them to come in because last time there was this weird thing and I never thought about. And I'm going to come in again for that. It's hard. I know the, the the books have to make have to add up at the end of the day. You can't just keep buying random crap and yep. stuff doesn't move. Yep. Um, and that's why it's not an easy business to run. Yeah, definitely not. Um, but the thing is, is I didn't talk about we didn't talk about the fact of having gaming space. And I think in today's day and age. That's a pretty major one. Yeah, it's kind of almost a given. It's kind of a given. You know, and sometimes you're just literally restricted by the size or what you can afford from a rental standpoint. Yeah. But you got, in order for you to foster that community for that return and customer and that really investment in your brand, you need to have a place that feels welcoming and open. Yeah. You know, I remember back in the day when I was in college, there was a game store, it was called Monster's Den in Minneapolis in the fucking ghetto. <laughs> it was scary as hell the first time I went there. It was just dark, dark and dingy. It felt like an <laughs> old warehouse. It was cool as hell. They had a couple of big, cushy uh, couches. It was a big magic store, but they had D&D stuff. They had uh, painting stuff, whatever. A couple of big, floofy couches over in one side of the, the room with a big, huge TV that they, people were playing Smash Bros on. Yes. And so people are sitting there playing magic at the tables. People are like cheering and jumping up or whatever, playing Smash Bros. Right. You know, guys at the counter are, are talking about whatever D&D stuff, have a book open. Like that's a community. You need to foster that. Even that place didn't sell video games. Yeah. It was about creating an environment that people wanted to be at. Yes. Now you're going to be have clingers. I mean, you're always are clingers and sometimes you're actually doing your community a service. If there is a 16 year old kid that if he's not at school, he's at your store all hours of the day, you're probably doing something good. Yeah. Cause that kid is not doing something else he would have been doing. And I've seen those kids a lot and those kids, you know, they're riding that thin line. I'd rather have them playing magic in your store than out in the streets or whatever. So yeah. it's important to really build that community. And that requires space, you know, it requires tables. I would say ditch some product to have a single table or something people to sit at and commune over. Yeah. Um, additionally, what else can you do that an online store can't do? And I think that's really hook into other local businesses. I yeah. think it'd be amazing if I was at a game store and I could order takeout from a restaurant down the street. So if you had like menus and like mm. a phone number or some kind of special connection to like a restaurant nearby or something nearby so that I could get the food to the store without me even needing to leave. Uh, this is all about what you just said, creating a place where people want to be. Right. And having that kind of fun experience would definitely make it fun for myself. Um, like I know uh, in Australia, in, and I think it, uh, there's a game club that Trent is working on and his building is above a brewery and I think they have a discount for the brewery when they go down there oh baby it's awesome or like at breweries in Minnesota you can order takeout like a, for instance at uh, Lynn Lake Brewery you can get taco cat and it, it, it's come right to you it, it's amazing is it made with real cats no it's not uh, unfortunately no I'm just kidding I love cats <laughs> um, it's great um, so like yeah fun experiences like that I feel like there are so many you could think about um, that, that just involve leveraging what is around you that is around no one else other than yourself. I want to tell a quick story about that, uh, a successful experience with that. Um, shortly after, well, I'd been painting for less than a year and the local game store asked if, you know, they had some like celebration. I think it was their like, two year anniversary or something of their game store. And they asked if I would put on a, like a beginner painting class. You know, it was kind of, it would be a, like, uh, a walk in or a step in or whatever. And people could either bring whatever mini they wanted to learn to paint or they had some at the store. And so, I mean, I uh, being a nice guy and I made a lot of mistakes in doing this. I brought my own paint. Like everyone was using all of my, paint. <laughs> it was, it was a drop in kind of thing. So I spent eight straight hours <laughs> there because people came in and I helped them and they left and whatever. And another buddy, Dustin, who listens to the podcast, he was there and we kind of tag teamed it and it was, it was cool. It was a long day. 
the radio station, local pop radio station, <laughs> they came in because the, I didn't know this. The store is going to do an inter, like they're doing an interview and talking about their, you know, their sales and, and it was their anniversary and what they do there, or whatever. The radio DJ guys in there and whatever. And he walks over with the, with the owner and the owner's like, hey, you should sit down and John will show, you know, teach you how to paint a miniature. Who? Teach who? I teach the radio DJ. <laughs> oh, man. And he ended up writing a whole story on their website, uh, their, their KROC website, and it was in the newspaper about this experience. That's so freaking cool. And he had his mini that he painted. Oh, it was man, a, dude. It was a little mummy that he painted Minnesota Vikings colors. <laughs> <laughs> and he said at the end of it, he's like, honestly, this was a ton of fun. He was like, this was super cool. I never knew this kind of thing existed, blah, blah. He was kind of a, mm. you know, he's a, a chat or whatever. Like he just, <laughs> so, he, he, but whatever, he was, he was really into it. And then, you know, a couple of months later, the, um, the owner of the store is like, we've had so many people come in here and talk about like, oh, they play board games and stuff. And like to paint those things, cause they heard about it on the radio or they saw it in the newspaper or whatever. And it's like, by building a building a, a network within your community of other businesses, you're going to help each other. Join your obviously join your chamber of commerce. You know, get to get the word out of what you do and what makes what you do valuable to your community. I mean, oftentimes with these nerd hobbies, we're very kind of feeling segregated. Oh, big time! You know, yeah. and we we feel like we're all we're a very niche group, and that's why going to things like conventions is so great. Yes, because we we get to be amongst our people. You, you don't want to be that way if you're running the business. You want to be inclusive. You want to bring new blood in. You want to bring new players in. You want to help share what you do and why it's valuable. And that means building relationships. So mm -hmm. I blabbed even more on that one. That was good. Well, good. Hopefully that was a lot of, uh, I don't know, helpful opinions about owning and running a game store. Maybe if you're just a patron of a game store and you heard something that was funny, maybe you can go and suggest it to your local managers and owners if they're willing to to take feedback um, yeah i think that's a big one too i've throughout the years i mean i have met some amazing owners of game stores and i've met some real doozies <laughs> and that's a big thing if you're not open-minded if you are not inclusive to feedback to what your community wants and stuff you're gonna have a hard time of it so you know work on that look inside yourself do you need to reevaluate. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I'm curious what the sprues and spruettes think that we missed or what's what's to them very important or maybe things that have really upset them or frustrated them. Oh, yeah. Let's hear that. How about that? So please put that in the comments of the YouTube channel here. YouTube video, not the channel, just the video. Yeah. Um, if you're listening to this, you can either head over to the Facebook group and we can talk about it there or you can pop on the YouTube channel just to type in your comment and we'll read those and see if we can help. And if you are like Jay and you own a game store or you work at a game store, what we're creating here in these comments are free work, free advice for you. Free customer advice. Free customer advice. This is the kind of, you know, <laughs> research that usually would cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. So yeah, you can give us a little dono just down to the link. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, Check it out. No, this is great. Yeah. So, so that me and John, we make our store in Minnesota. We know how to make the best The painting store. play pace. Oh, oh, right. Yes. The drop pod. Three P's. Yeah. Not P3. No. Three P's. Yeah. Three P. Three P. <laughs> Just three P. Okay. Painting play place. All right. That's it for that topic. On to the news. What's Numero. new in the newsy news? Numero uno. There's a South African painting short film about our hobby called paint and plastic and someone emailed me the trailer of it and I watched it and it's amazing. It, it, it seems very well produced. Yeah. And it seems, it seems like the guys who are talking about it are so emotionally and joyfully invested in the hobby and it means so much to them and it comes across in a fucking trailer. Right. So I'm very excited for the release of this feature or short. It's a short. It's about maybe like, I don't know, whatever, five, 10 minutes long or longer. Uh, I'm very excited for it. So oh, I, I thought it's like an hour long. I have no idea. Yeah. It's not I, short. What the fuck? Yeah. I think it's an hour long or roughly an hour long and it's going to be on YouTube. Ex and on that channel where the trailer is? Do you know? I don't know. I mean, everyone can click the link below and find out. 
<laughs> you know, we could also I maybe think in the in in the trailer thing in the video description on the trailer it tells you some details. Okay, let's uh, let's. So just... why don't you do that? I'll do that, and you it... can talk about how it's made your loins feel. My loins. Um. Yeah, I thought it was. I I'm very intrigued. I if, after watching that trailer, I really wanted to watch the whole thing, which I think that's the point of a trailer. So yes. good job on that. Good job on that trailering. Yes. So here's what it says. Pain in Plastic, a mini pain documentary, examines the big role of miniature painting and the impact it's had on the lives of those in it. It premieres on the 18th of December, 2020 on YouTube, I assume on this channel, uh, which is called Tiny Tin Toy Productions. Um, so yes, be on the lookout for that. It's going to be fantastic. I, this is kind of one of those things where it's like, Something like this should have already existed for the miniature painting world, but we're just kind of like lagging behind everything. Mm -hmm. And this is a really nicely produced and hopefully, I mean, I, I haven't seen the whole thing yet, but it seems like it's very nicely produced, well thought out, a little documentary. I'm it's curious, be, I'm curious where the story goes, the more depth to it. I'm curious. Right, because typically there's a, there's a narrative, right? It's not just asking a bunch of painters what they think about miniature painting. Like they're, they're, they're probably going to try to get a point across. Right. Um, yeah, I'm curious and I, about that. And I wonder whether how the fact that this is in South Africa. Mm-hmm. Like, how does that affect the story? Will, I, I, will it be some kind of a factor? It's got to be. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe I'm just obtuse and didn't realize how big the miniature hobby is in South Africa. Uh, yeah, I have no idea. I just, um, yeah, I just assumed after District 9 that all the, <laughs> all the bugs just, you know, ate all the miniatures. <laughs> does that take place in South Africa? I think District so. 9? I think so. I mean, I know the main actor and director and writer... I think it's all the same dude. I, I know he's South African. Yeah, because the their you know their big thing is um, like the encampment is all there, and then it's like what what the locals are dealing with with the with the bugs, the bugs, the prawns. Good movie, An amazing movie. I love that movie. Yeah, I've seen it so many times. Really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> that's just so funny. Have you seen Chappie? Like the kind of kind of the follow up to it. No, I haven't. Okay, I haven't seen it either. Oh. So it's okay. I, I won't make fun of you right now. Okay. Anyways, I thought we had a really interesting opportunity in this next news item because oh. sitting across from me is, up until a couple weeks ago, the only Resin Beasts winner. Sure. John Nunez. Or John Nunez. <laughs> John Nunez? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so yeah, they announced a winner of the online Resin Beasts because they weren't able to do it in person at Adepticon, namely. And I was just curious being a person who did paint something that was supposed to go in that competition and then it not happening and then them doing it online and you not wanting to enter it online because you're like, I'm going to wait for the real event. Sure. How do you feel about this? How do I feel? You don't got to feel anything in particular. I was curious if you do. I mean, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm just more, I, f I fear that my feelings are too tightly connected to the frustration that Adepticon didn't happen last year. That's fair. Um, and I understand why they did an online one. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's noble that in this time, anybody that's trying to keep people focused on the hobby and, and, you know, kind of not worrying about all the other things in our lives that are going on that are frustrating. But I got a problem. First of all, can we just say this model is beautiful? Yeah. Which one are we talking about? Um, it's called the oh the big dude. I don't fucking know. I don't think that was the one that won the king best of Ecstasy. overall. It did. Oh, I thought it was the little one that won the best overall. But uh, maybe I'm wrong. I'm just conf. It was a bit confusing, quite frankly, to me. Um, yeah, models are cool. It's just very hard to have. A, I just I'm not a fan of big painting competitions where you're taking a picture and sending it in. Yes. It's just from a judging perspective, from a you know legitimate competition perspective it's just it just sucks <laughs> but you know it's like i don't know i don't know it's, it is it is tough because i mean you don't want to you don't want to think anyone's editing their photos and i think likely they're not um but it's like you just kind of open yourself to that possibility and it kind of scares you right um and also you get to only show the angles you want to show right you don't get to take a picture of the underside of this model's chin that looks like bare resin right uh, which it doesn't but like you know there, when you pay for a competition part of the experience is <laughs> worrying about all the minutiae that you don't normally have to worry about right and i say part of the experience and not part of the fun 
because that is not fun. Yeah. Uh, painting every single nook and cranny of this model uh, in laboring over it so that every single angle is exactly how you want it to yeah. be. But I will say that feeling on Friday night when we realized we hit the final cut for Crystal Brush, all of those extra hours and sweat and tears that went into it, even making final cut doesn't feel as good as it feels if you don't have to go through all of that. Like that, that is, oh, it is right. the pain, the payoff that, that makes the payoff worth it. Nothing yeah. in life that comes easy feels great when it's done. That's just the way it works. Nothing in life feels easy no, no. when no, it's done. Nothing in life that is easy oh. feels great when it's done. Nothing in life that is easy feels great when it's done. It can feel good. I mean, why? Yeah. But it doesn't feel great. Why doesn't it feel great? To finish, to finish something that's very difficult to finish. No, no. Nothing in life that is easy. Oh. So if it's yeah, yeah, easy. Sorry, I, got, I got you. I got you. Okay. Sorry. I'm just being an idiot so right now. So it's easy to do it. Right. It's not, it's that's not sense fulfilling. Of satisfaction. Right. There, so. oh, okay. I'm okay. not saying that the, uh, to be very clear, I am not saying that the folks that, that entered Resin oh. Beast didn't put a bubble oh, yeah, to yeah, work yeah, yeah, in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Obviously did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously did. I, I do 100% agree that there's this extra Oof. tier of, of kind of work that you put into it um, when you know that they're going to pick the thing up and look at it in all possible angles under the best possible light with their own eyeballs from two inches away. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's cool. Um, if they would offer the same price pool, I would enter. Yeah. So there's that winner of resin beast 2020. That's what, it, that's what the caption on Instagram says about this entry from Radicraft. Cool. I think you won. Great NMM on the trim and also all the gore in between the claws. I love it. It's very good. Okay. That was a cool thing that no other podcast gets to do because I am sitting across from an award-winning painter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> something, something that I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> all um, right. GW you giving out free models? Yeah, free models. You yeah, hear about this? Incentivizing this? people to come into stores. I have is seen that, this. Is that the time? Is this the time for that? No, I don't. Yeah, I don't understand. I mean, okay, I, I understand because like maybe they're they're in stores, in store stores. Their stores are struggling right now due to the coronavirus, so they're incentivizing it further. I feel like this would be a great idea at any other time than right now. Mm -hmm. So, I, yeah, I, I, I don't think, get it entirely. I think if you have, I think if you have like the right kind of restrictions in place where it's like okay only five people can be in the store at a time yeah, yeah and yeah. all that um they are trying to push foot traffic traffic so i'm not hounded on them for that at the start of each month there's a free model and then you can go to the store and you get the free model to start of the month no purchase required so they're gonna have the first day that the store is open in any, any given month there's gonna I don't want to say it's going to be like Black Friday or whatever. It's going to depend <laughs> store to store, but yeah. a lot of people are going to be there. So you're kind of is it limited the model. For yes. Free? Okay. It's, it's I don't well I don't know if it's the only place you can get that model, but each store only has so many. Okay, it's like twenty to the forty something like that. Whatever it is, I don't know. They didn't tell you the number, but also they have these coins yep. that are only available in store, and only if you spend like a hundred bucks or whatever, you get the coin. Okay. And then a little collector thing. Collector coin. And then after you get six of them, you can get this box that holds all the coins in it. Yeah. And that's kind of cool because that's what you could use for your. Um, why am I blanking on the name of these things? I'm objectives. Sure. Oh, right, right. <laughs> yeah, use the coins for your objectives. I kind of hate tchotchkes. So, like, I have zero interest in those coins. Like, if I spent $100, I would be like, I don't want it. Um, <laughs> Here, let me take it. Throw it in garbage. <laughs> it's right in front of him. I no. just chuck it in the paint pit at the <laughs> painting play place. <laughs> a bunch of people just like dive in there looking <laughs> for it. Like, oh no! Yeah. I just gouged my eye out on this bed in black. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of like chach keys like that. Um, but I, there are people that are collectors. I mean, we're kind of all collectors, right? So it makes sense why they would do something like that. Mm hmm. So they have a daughter of Kane model. Yep, that's the first one. We're, and that one's done already because they announced this, and then it was like, bam, we're gonna do it. For it was like it was later in this first month, I think, because it was timing or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a cool looking little daughter with a couple of swordy swords. Yeah, 
Little so, daggery daggers. That's just weird to have free stuff from GW. Uh, they're like, ha ha ha. We're just going to mark up the price of everything else so we get our money <laughs> either way. No. That's um, funny. But yeah, I just thought that was newsy news worth cheering. Absolutely. Okay, All right. What's next? Last item on the newsy news Marika Reimer, miniature painting legend. If you don't know, early on when America was learning how to paint miniatures in a good way, a lot of the forerunners for American miniature display painting were mostly female. Mm-hmm. Marika Reimer being one of those big ones. Um, she released a tutorial on painting her old crystal brush winning piece, best in show piece um, that I think was 2015 or 2014. One of the two. It's a dark sport miniatures model and she does this insane free hand on the cloak. Yeah. And so I, I did a little peruse um, and uh, she mentions the squint test. And I love this because I've talked about this maybe once or twice in videos in the past where while you're painting something, uh, you take a break and you stare at it with your eyes squinted to kind of see if you have the volumes and the colors in the right spot. You're basically removing blending from the equation. Ah. Uh, so it's, just, it's kind of this you know, little intermediate test that you can do. And it made me really happy to see that Marika Reimer also does something similar to that. Which is kind of ties into your video on how this is was painted kind of yeah because that style of painting is really about getting volumes and highlights and colors in the right spot in the right spot contrast in the right air, yep. right amount yep yeah and then the airbrush to you know get the squinting yeah that's the, yeah the, the squinting airbrush yeah um but yeah she, she mentioned that the reason she did it now i don't know four sorry six or five years later was that it felt like a good time. Uh, I think probably mostly due to the coronavirus. Um, but yeah, it's super cool that she had all the f- in-progress photos in the first place, and then she wrote that cool article. And obviously, we'll, we'll link all these news items in the show notes below, so you can check them out as well. I had no idea that that article existed, so I'm glad that you shared that, because that's really cool. Thank you. She's not one that you get a lot of deets on either. She doesn't paint a whole lot at the moment. I believe she is out in the Pacific Northwest pursuing a PhD. Um, and I think it might be done. I think she might have finished it. So she hasn't been painting a whole lot. She's super into bugs. So her PhD is bug related. Insectology. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. She mentioned that in an interview um, that I did of her a couple years ago at, at uh, Adepticon. Sweet. So maybe not. Maybe she's done or soon to be done. Maybe she'll paint some more. Who knows? All right. Welcome to the end of the podcast. My hat has changed orientation. Pay no attention to that. <laughs> Actually, pay attention to that because a hat orientation changed in the after party, which is one of the many ways that you can support the podcast if you want to. With an extended episode that includes fun things like me and John talking about our favorite models that we saw from other painters, uh, new things that we tried out, and also giving feedback to one of the sprues and spruettes in the community, you can listen to us for even longer if you want to. (laughs) Why you'd want to. The world may never know. (laughs) It's like how many licks does it take? Alternatively, you can also support the podcast by giving us reviews on the places where you listen to podcasts, like Apple Podcasts. You can tell your nerd friends about our thing. You can buy our sexy merch from Mark Richards' uh, lovely t-shirt or sweater that John is now modeling very sexily. Do it sexier. Hell yeah. Dude. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's it. Um, thanks for hanging out with us and listening to us ramble. Any final words, Johnson? Yes. Scottson. Um, I do have a final word. I want to talk about putting paint on mini, something we haven't talked about. Ooh, lately. a little bit of accountability. And I've been forgetting to bring this up on the podcast, but it's something that our many amazing members of our Facebook group are spending time doing and talking about their hobby streak, um, as well as. Like that accountability um that they're pushing back on us on paint on mini which is great and so i want to hear are you guys still doing paint on mini do you got a streak going if not start a new streak start today right yeah let's get that paint on that mini all you got to do is put it on the brush just put the paint on the brush dude that's all you got to do sit mm-hmm. there sit down in the seat put paint on the brush sprut and spruette and <laughs> magic will happen words words <laughs> phrases <laughs> unicorns <laughs> And uh, also keep those true whips coming. It's true whip is the actual hashtag to use. Yes, not real whip. True whip. Not whips. 
No. Oh, yeah. True. Oh, it's yes. Important distinction. T R U E W I P. And if you have a true whip, you should also tag us because I look at all of those true whips. Mm -hmm. And And I have been, yeah. Yeah. And some of them I give a heart to. Just some of them? I mean, all of them. Mm, A little sus, (laughs) John. Red is sus. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. We'll catch you on the flippity flop.